Well, hello. In this video, Thomas DeLauer and myself are doing a joint video on the three most common muscle building myths. We'll be going back and forth, starting with me. Enjoy. Thanks, Dr. Berg. Guys, I'm so stoked to be able to be here along with Dr. Berg, dropping some serious science and some serious knowledge on you guys. So Dr. Berg, why don't you take it away, you lead it off, and then I'll give you my take. Hey guys, Dr. Berg here. In this video, we're gonna talk about the three most common muscle building myths, okay? Myth number one, we need carbohydrates to build muscle, okay? Now it is true that we need insulin to help build muscle, that's true. And carbohydrates do trigger insulin. So naturally, the more carbs we eat, the more insulin we produce, and the more muscle development we'll have, correct? Not quite, because the problem is when you do excessive carbs, you make insulin unavailable, okay? So insulin can't work anymore. Now, how much carbohydrate does a person really need? Is there such a thing as an essential carbohydrate? Actually, no. To understand carbohydrates, you really have to understand blood sugars. What is normal blood sugars? So a person with normal blood sugar would only have about one teaspoon of sugar in their entire body of blood. So we don't need much sugar. In fact, our bodies can even make sugar from the protein that we consume. But the average person consumes between 27 and 31 teaspoons of sugar every single day. That's 27 times more than we really need. So we have a situation where we have massive amounts of insulin, yet it's unavailable to the cells. It's unavailable for the muscles to grow. Thus the poor muscle development with high carbohydrate diets. So what is the solution? To answer that, I'm gonna bring on my friend, Thomas DeLauer, to see what he has to say. You nailed it. There's not even a whole lot more I can add to that, but what I'm gonna ultimately say is, I used to be that person that was consuming a lot of carbohydrates to try to build muscle. And quite honestly, you guys have seen my before pictures probably, and we're gonna show them on the screen right now. That's what I looked like when I was consuming carbohydrates all the time. So you have a really good point. It's that insulin resistance that Dr. Berg is talking about. You're, you're consuming so many carbohydrates that your body is essentially adapted to them and it has to start creating more and more and more insulin just to have a simple response to carbohydrates. So therefore, it can make it so that it's very hard on your body. Now, to add on to what you were saying, Dr. Berg, what people need to understand is that ketones, like when you're in a low carbohydrate state or when you're on a ketogenic diet, are actually very, very muscle preserving. So believe it or not, when you have ketones in the blood, like when you're on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, your muscles hold on to the carbohydrates that they would normally have. So it's kind of crazy, but ketones actually preserve carbohydrates in our muscles, which means that our muscles are protected from catabolism. Our muscles are protected from being broken down. Now, the only time that you will potentially lose muscle when you're on a low carb diet is if your protein levels are too high or you go too long without eating. Now, mind you, there's a strategic way to do it, and you and I talk about it all the time when it comes down to combining ketosis and fasting but you don't want your body to start breaking down your own muscle tissue. But the best way that you can avoid that is keeping your fat content high. But mind you, you do not want to have your fat content high also when your carbs are high, because then you spike your insulin and the fat goes right into storage. So to add on to what you were saying, Dr. Berg, it's really pretty simple. We need to throw away all the mainstream stuff that we've been hearing about building muscle and having to spike our insulin and start realizing that it comes a lot more down to something known as mTOR, which is the mechanistic target of rapamycin. What that is, is the body's actual anabolic pathway. That anabolic pathway is what allows us to build muscle. And there are a multitude of things that increase mTOR. And a lot of them are just having to do with the right kind of training, but also making sure that our blood sugar isn't constantly going up and down. So anyway, Dr. Berg, I'm gonna let you lead off and go on to myth number two, and then I'll give you guys my feedback on that as well. Well, thank you, Thomas. That was a great explanation. All right, myth number two, we need lots of protein to build muscle because your muscles are made out of protein. Makes sense, right? And here's a fact that a lot of people don't know and don't understand. Your body recycles protein. It's very efficient with protein. It doesn't lose a lot of protein. And when you add keto and intermittent fasting, you're going to spike something called human growth hormone. 
by a significant degree. And this hormone is the main protein sparer. In other words, it protects the loss of protein. So on average, a person would need between three and six ounces of high quality protein for each meal. Now that's an average. It could be a little more, could be a little less. Now what's going to happen if you consume too much protein? For that answer, let's go to Thomas and see what he has to say. You know, I actually had to laugh a little bit when you were talking about that one because being in the fitness industry, I've been exposed so much to people that are always telling me that you need to be consuming copious amounts of protein and I've always been kind of the black sheep of the bunch saying that you don't need that much. And I appreciate your explanation because it's spot on. I'll add to it just really quickly. Uh, there were a multitude of studies, but one of the main studies that ultimately concluded this uh, found that is you really only need about 0.5 to 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And that's honestly on kind of the high end. That's if you're really trying to build some muscle. So hopefully that resonates with some people. Now, when you consume too much protein, well, first off, it can trigger the body to go into what's called gluconeogenesis, where it takes all the extra protein and just converts it into sugar, which ultimately gets stored as fat. You see, what ends up happening is extra sugar that doesn't need to be there ends up getting processed by the liver and stored as adipose tissue. It gets stored as fat. So yeah, extra protein can actually cause you to store more fat. And it's a lot more of a process of testosterone, human growth hormone, and some of these other compounds that are going on in the body just like you said, that actually contribute to truly building muscle. Now, it can actually have a negative effect on your kidneys if you have too much protein. Now, you have to go pretty far to have a serious effect on your kidneys, but when they actually started looking at urine samples, they did find that urea nitrogen levels were elevated, which means that people were wasting protein when they had too much. So the biggest thing here, outside of the fact that you could be hurting your kidneys, is you're wasting your money. Because if you're eating good, high quality protein, like good organic meats that you should be, and getting your protein from good, honest sources, and compiling complete proteins from different amino acid profiles, then you're spending a good amount of money on it. And it's probably gonna be what you're spending the most money on out of your entire diet. So don't waste it. So all you have to do is make sure that you're in the right nitrogen balance. In order to make some sense of this, I'll just use sort of an example. When you are in a positive nitrogen balance, it means that you have enough protein to sustain and build muscle. When you are in a negative nitrogen balance, it means that you don't have enough. It's pretty hard to be in a negative nitrogen balance. What we usually want to be in is just right smack in the middle. Perfect nitrogen balance. Just enough nitrogen going in that is needed. Protein is measured in the way of nitrogen. If we have way too much nitrogen, then it's hard on the body. And that's why it would register in a lot of studies as extra urea nitrogen, meaning too much protein. So we only need to have slightly above baseline to actually build muscle. Anything above baseline or slightly above baseline is all overkill. You would never believe this by looking at me, but I consume only about 90 to 100 grams of protein per day. I don't consume that much. In fact, I don't even eat all that much, which is a whole nother myth for an entirely different day. But Dr. Berg, send it back to you to talk about myth number three. That was a really good answer, Thomas. Now let's go to myth number three, and that is building more muscle mass will burn more fat. That is absolutely not true. Building more muscle mass will increase your ability to burn more calories, but we have to differentiate what type of calories that we're burning. Is it fat calories or is it stored sugar calories? There's a lot of people who have a lot of muscle mass, but they're not necessarily lean. So the real question is, how do we burn fat calories and not only sugar calories? To answer that, let's go to Thomas and see what he has to say. Well, yeah, I'm a perfect example of someone that had a lot of muscle, but still didn't exactly look good. <laughs> when I was 280 pounds, I had a lot of muscle, but I was hardly lean. So to your point, that's exactly right. The thing is, is we have to condition our bodies to understand how to use fat as a source of fuel. That comes down not just to ketosis, but to good old fashioned fat adaptation. And I've talked about this in videos of my own before. Fat adaptation is something that occurs when the body starts to develop the mitochondrial machinery, the actual cellular ability to utilize fats as a source of fuel. Now, ketosis is one thing. Ketosis is when you're nutritionally priming your body to use fats as a source of fuel during that period of time. Fat adaptation is taking it a step further. Fat adaptation is where your body has gotten so used to using ketones and fat that it actually changes its chemistry. The mitochondria, which creates energy, actually changes structure, changes its machinery to become more receptive to fat. 
So when you have muscle, it doesn't necessarily mean that your body's just gonna incinerate fat. It's not like muscle just gobbles up fat. In fact, that makes no sense. Fat doesn't just, just disappear into muscle. Fat has to be utilized, it has to be mobilized. You still have to have cardio involved. You still have to have caffeine involved. You still have to have these other factors. So when it comes down to getting your body to utilize fats as a source of fuel, sure, having muscle on board is going to help you, but you still need to be eating the right kinds of things. Otherwise, you're just going to burn more calories in general, which means you could just eat some of your own muscle tissue. Your body is very good at creating energy in the most efficient process for it at that time, which means if you are in a position where your body wants to burn sugar, it's just gonna keep burning sugar. And if you run out of sugar, it's gonna break down protein into sugar via gluconeogenesis. So what you need to do is you need to exercise using some intermittent fasting techniques. Okay, intermittent Intermittent fasting and ketosis. Intermittent fasting is probably the fastest way that you can get your body to start understanding how to use fat as a source of fuel because it kind of runs out of options. That's what we really want to get the body into doing. We want it to say, well, wait a minute, I have no choice but to start trying to use fat as a source of fuel. And then once it gets the taste of blood, so to speak, it actually gets the taste of fat, it just rolls with it and it enjoys it. And you can keep that process going by eating higher fat foods and lower carbohydrates. And I know we talk about this a lot. We might sound like broken records because Dr. Berg, you and I are the leading experts in the world of ketosis and fasting on YouTube by far. And people are expecting us to talk about it. But when you give them the science, we give them the details, it makes a lot more sense. You are much more likely to build muscle and to stay lean if you do it right by utilizing a ketogenic and intermittent fasting style diet. Anyway, I hope that that clears that up, Dr. Berg. So thanks so much for your answers, Thomas, and thank you for watching.